Hello everybody, I'm Tom Minnery from Focus on the Family. I'm sure you'll agree that marriage is society's most important social institution. It's the soil that grows a family. It's also the glue that holds a family together. Unfortunately, marriage is under attack like never before. First, the divorce revolution rejected the vows that say, till death do us part. And now, the homosexual revolution is trying to erase the very definition of marriage, which is one mother and one father. We all need to know how to defend marriage intelligently and persuasively. That's why we've recorded the presentation that you're about to see. Glenn Stanton is focused on the family's senior research analyst for marriage. He will give you the very best arguments that he has honed to a fine edge in the rough and tumble of university debates all around the country. Glenn has condensed his debating points into 10 key questions and answers. Now we've designed this DVD so that you don't have to digest all of the information at once. You can review specific sections to master the questions and answers that you find most helpful. We want you to get comfortable enough with this information so that you can persuade others. In fact, in the back of the accompanying booklet, we have a website address where you can download the charts that you are about to see. So you can use them yourself. One last point before we move to the presentation. These arguments are composed of common sense, historical facts, and scientific research results, but not scriptural passages. Rather than speaking directly from God's word, Glenn makes the case from how God's world works. Now we've taken this approach because we want to reach as many people as possible, especially those who may not believe in the Bible. Now the exciting fact is that these worldly arguments underscore everything the Bible says about marriage. They help us speak God's truth to an increasingly confused and drifting culture. And that is something all of us are called to do. God bless you as you train to become able defenders of God's first institution, the family. Here's Glenn Stanton. <laughs> Good morning. It's my pleasure to be with you and to be able to talk with you this morning about a very, very important subject and to really seek to help equip you to engage the issue of same-sex marriage and to do it with compassion, love, and intelligence. Not long ago, I was engaged in a debate on same-sex marriage at the University of Texas and the very gracious literature professor who was moderating the debate that night opened up the debate by really pondering aloud I, I thought was an interesting question. And her wonderful Texas twang, which I'm just going to absolutely butcher, she, she wondered aloud, same-sex marriage, aren't all marriages same-sex marriage? I mean, the same sex week after week, month after month. <laughs> And there's something in that. There's something about the commonality of marriage, the commitment of marriage, people committing themselves to one another and living a common life together that is very, very important. And we're going to talk about that today. And we're going to talk about why that's important and why that's necessary. The purpose of what we're doing here today is to share with you what we've learned. In my role at Focus on the Family, I have had the distinct opportunity of being able to go out to many college campuses and many interesting situations to debate many interesting personalities from the other side and engage this issue of same-sex marriage. And in doing that over the years, we have developed and we have learned really what works. What works, what works best, what is most persuasive, and what doesn't. And we want to share with you this morning what works best. The lines that we and the arguments that we keep coming back to over and over and over again. And they really come down to ten questions. If you can master these ten questions, you will really have the understanding that I typically draw from whenever I go out and debate. And so you need to understand that it's really not that difficult. If you're comfortable with these ten issues, these ten points, then you can be really as, as well equipped as I do when I go out to do that. And that's the purpose for us to be able to share that with you. And not only just for you to learn about it, 
but hopefully for each of you to take this information and the materials that we've handed out that accompany this, this video product and to be able to learn and to then go ahead and teach other people in your community, in your churches, how to engage this issue. Because it's very important that we replicate ourselves and we teach other people how to persuasively engage this issue. One of the first things that I would encourage you to do as you start to move out and engage this issue, I think it will be the most helpful thing you could do. And it's this. Make a friend in an opponent from the other side. Make a friend in somebody who identifies homosexually. And not a friendship to an end or as a mission, as good as that might be, but a friend for friend's sake. And in this work, I've developed a number of very, very good friendships with my opponents. And in those friendships, it constantly checks me to make sure that I'm not just presenting this information in truth, but that I'm doing it in love as well. And folks, as Christians, that's exactly what we're called to do, to share the truth in love. And making a friend in the other side and developing that relationship will help us do that. And so I encourage you to do that. It's important for us to understand why we need to engage this issue. I was looking through Time or Newsweek magazine a couple of weeks ago, and I came upon a very interesting quote. This is from a leader of one of the largest same-sex marriage lobbies in the nation. And he said this, We are not going to win at the ballot box until we start winning at the water cooler and in the church pews. That is where this battle is being fought out where we have our casual conversations with our fellow citizens. And each one of us need to learn how to engage that battle intelligently. When we're working with coworkers or talking over the back fence with our neighbor about an issue, we need, to, we need to give an answer for the things that come at us. We need to be able to answer this issue at the water cooler and in the church pews. The other side understands that, and that's where they're going to be engaging it. We need to do the same thing. And this presentation, this material that we're presenting, seeks to help us do exactly that. Now, as I said earlier, it all comes down to 10 questions. We have narrowed this presentation down to 10 key questions. Master these points, and you will be well-suited to really handle anything that comes up to you. So let's move. Let's start. Question number one. How will same-sex marriage hurt your marriage? I get this question all the time. When I debate, typically before the debate, I'm introduced to my opponent, and either he or she, their partner is there with them, and I meet them as a couple. And then sometime during the debate, they say, well, Mr. Stanton, how will mine and my relationship with Joan hurt your family? And that's a great question. It's probably one of the best questions that the other side has for us. And here's how I answer. You know... If this were just about you and Joan, then maybe we could work something out. Because there really wouldn't be any harm if we just simply let you and Joan get married. But that, folks, is not what we're talking about. That is not the proposition on the table. The proposition on the table is asking all of us in society to radically and permanently alter our own definition and understanding of family to say that ultimately male and female, husband and wife, mother and father do not matter for the family. And now I'm raising a whole host of little boys and little girls. And my job is to make sure that I raise those boys and girls to grow up to be good, healthy men and women. And I will never allow you or any other same-sex marriage advocate to teach my little children that their gender, their being as, as little boys or little girls to grow up as men and women do not matter for the family. But you saying that your same-sex family is, is just as valuable, just as important, just as necessary as my family absolutely sends that message to my little boys and my little girls. It says that they as gendered beings, as males and females, are not essential for the family. How does your marriage hurt my marriage? It hurts my marriage by teaching my children that their gender does not matter. And as a father, I will never, never allow that to happen. I cannot 
allow it to happen. And neither can any of the rest of us. Because male and female, as we'll see later, matters far too much to say it's just simply preferential for the family. Question number two. Is same-sex marriage like interracial marriage? We get that question, again, nearly every time. Is same-sex marriage like interracial marriage? They are nothing alike, and here's the difference. Racism is about keeping the races apart, and that is always wrong. Segregation was a serious, serious social problem. The fact that marriage exists exclusively between men and women folks is not a social problem. It is a deep, deep social good. Marriage is about bringing the genders together, male and female, about celebrating diversity, bringing male and female together to a unified whole, to cooperate together, to live together, to found homes together, to create children together, to raise those children. That is why interracial marriage and same-sex marriage are nothing alike. Interracial marriage affirmed marriage or, or knocking down the bans on interracial marriage affirmed marriage by saying that any man has a right to marry any woman regardless of race. But same-sex marriage rather redefines marriage to say that marriage is not necessarily about male and female, husband and wife, but it's really about any two people who care for one another. And that is a radical and dangerous new definition of marriage that unfortunately we just can't tolerate. Marriage has nothing to do with race. Marriage has everything to do with bringing men and women together. And lastly, we need to ask the question, how different is it for a child to say, I have two moms, than it is for a child to say, I have a black father and a white mother? Okay? There is no research whatsoever that shows us that there is serious child developmental harm from children being raised by interracial parents. But there's a whole host of research showing us that there is significant developmental harm from children being raised by in either fatherless or motherless families, and intentionally fatherless or motherless families, which every same-sex home is. We need to understand there's a dramatic difference between these two things. So, no, interracial marriage or striking down the bans on interracial marriage is nothing like striking down bans on exclusively heterosexual marriage. And it really is an ugly thing to equate the two because segregation was run by an ugly, really evil system that kept people apart. What drives exclusively heterosexual marriage is a good thing. And to say that, that the two things are equal really does pollute the public discourse and really has no place in civil dialogue. And, and so the other side, our opponents, when they bring this up, should really be called on that point. Third question is, where does it stop? If we say that marriage is not necessarily about male or female, husband or wife, mother and father, then why is it necessarily just about two people? Andrew Sullivan, probably one of the most articulate spokespeople for the same-sex marriage proposition, had this to say. He says, the right to marry whomever you want is a fundamental civil right. Think about that. The right to marry whomever you want is a fundamental civil right. Andrew Sullivan is a very smart man, and he's actually smarter than this. But what he's saying is, whatever you want to enter into and call it marriage, you have a civil right to do that. I would ask Andrew Sullivan, what about Cody Rogan and Jonathan Yarbrough? Whenever we bring up this issue of same-sex marriage could lead to polygamy, they say, oh, you're ridiculous, that's a red herring, you're just trying to fill up the, the, the argument with, with unnecessary smoke and confuse people. So I ask them, what about Cody Rogan and Jonathan Yarbrough? Who are those gentlemen? Not a whole lot of people know who they are, but they should. 
Because on May 17, 2004, they were the first couple to stand in line in Provincetown, Massachusetts to get the first same-sex marriage license handed out there. And because they were the first couple standing in line, the media was very interested in talking to them. And as the media talked to them, here's what they learned. Cody Rogan and Jonathan Yarborough told the press that we believe we can have an open marriage. We believe that we can love more than one person at a time. And we intend to do that in our new marriage. Now, a couple of points here before I go on to my, my final point. Think about this. Think about any husband and wife couple who shows up to get married and they're asking the couple about their big day. And the groom says, you know what? I'm excited to be getting married, but I plan on keeping my options open, kind of going to continue to date around a little bit. You know, that is an individual with a wholly different idea of marriage than most of us have. But that is exactly what these two gentlemen said on their wedding day. Okay? But here's the big question. What are we going to say to Jonathan Yarbrough and Cody Rogan when they widen their circle of love and want to bring their other love interests into their relationship? Are we really going to be able to tell them, well, I'm sorry, marriage is only about two people? No. Once you let that horse out of the barn, there's no way to stop it. There is no logical stopping point. This question was asked of Cheryl Jakes, the former executive director of the Human Rights Campaign. He said, Cheryl, how come same-sex marriage will not lead to polygamy? And here's what she said. It's a stunning answer. She said, because I don't approve of that. Because I don't approve of that. All of us can now rest assured that same-sex marriage will not lead to polygamy because Cheryl Jakes doesn't approve of that. Well, here's the question. Cheryl, how come your, because I don't approve of that objection to polygamous marriage, is more reasonable, more thoughtful, than my, I don't believe in that objection, to same-sex marriage? You can't have it both ways. Again, once we say that there's no real definition to marriage, then marriage becomes everything, and marriage becomes nothing. Where does it stop? Full acceptance will be mandatory. Folks, we tolerate same-sex relationships today. I have never met a same-sex marriage activist who complains about friends of theirs meeting, setting up a relationship, moving into a neighborhood, buying a house, going to Home Depot on the weekends to get all the things to set up their house, and then weeks later were run out of the neighborhood on a rail, saying we don't tolerate that kind of thing here. You know what? The American people are pretty tolerant. They have tolerance. We have tolerance now. But what this is about is full acceptance. You, every one of you, will fully value the same-sex family as equal to the heterosexual family. And if you don't, there will be problems. Let's look at the way this works itself out. Speech control will be next. There's a Swedish pastor not too long ago preaching a sermon in his church from the scriptures in the Bible that talk about the nature of homosexuality. Some homosexual activists in Sweden got word of the sermon that he preached. They weren't in church that day, but they just heard about it, and they turned him into the authorities. He was called in for questioning, and he was threatened with months in jail threatened with months in jail, not for doing anything to anybody, not for hurting anybody, for simply saying something. Canadian activists, months after passing same-sex marriage in a number of provinces in Canada, passed Bill C-250. What is Bill C-250? Bill C-250 is a bill that says that if you say things that could be seen as hurtful to homosexuals, you could spend time in jail. Go to jail if you say the wrong thing. That's just north of our border, not very far from here. It's interesting. The statement, children need a mother and a father, could be deemed hate speech. And not long ago, just this week in fact, Massachusetts Governor Mitt Romney was taken to task by the Boston Globe because he had the audacity to say that children need a mother and a father. And the Boston Globe said that that was divisive hate speech and that he was wrong for saying that. Hate speech for saying that children need a mother and a father. Folks, 
That is the world that is not some distance off. That's the world we live in right now. It's happening right now. Speech control is next. It's here. What's in store for our children in schools? Heather has two mommies in K through 12. They will be teaching the homosexual family as normal, as natural, as a regular part of life starting in kindergarten. Pictures and storylines in school books will be changed, not just in the sociology books, not just in the health books. Your children's readers, they'll come home with their little readers, and Sally will be going to the duck pond with her two dads holding hands. It's interesting to think about. When little Sally gets to the duck pond with her two dads, what will she find? She'll find male and female ducks paired up there. They're not going to be able to work it out of everything because nature is something that we just cannot get away from. But folks, that's what we're going to see. Let me tell you again exactly what is happening in Boston schools now. May 17, 2004, Massachusetts legalized same-sex marriage. And it wasn't long until they started putting this into the schools. National Public Radio, no conservative news source to be sure, ran this story about what was happening in Boston public schools and Massachusetts public schools. It says that gay and lesbian advocates are working on a new gay-friendly curriculum for kindergarten and up. And it also talks about a teacher there, an eighth grade teacher, her name's Deb Allen, and it talks about what she is teaching young kids. It says that she is teaching eighth graders in her class with thoroughly explicit charts what lesbian and gay sex is like. It's what the article says right here. Thoroughly and explicit charts and graphs, what gay sex is like. And now when families and parents object to that kind of thing, here's what she tells them. Give me a break, it's legal now. Give me a break. It's legal now. Folks, that is what we are up against. It's happening. It's happening now. And it's happening in a very short, short period of time. The impact on religious freedom. Churches will be forced to perform same-sex weddings. And here's how it's going to happen. My opponents, our opponents on the other side say, Oh, no, 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 we're not going to force churches to perform these weddings. We just simply want the right to be able to marry if we want. Well, here's what's going to happen. There are going to be couples that go to XYZ Baptist Church or Presbyterian Church on the corner and sit down with a pastor and say, we'd like to get married in your church. And the pastor's going to say, I'm very, very sorry, but we don't believe in that kind of marriage here, so no. They're going to go straight down to the ACLU office and they're going to ask the question, does ABC, Presbyterian or Baptist Church on the corner get tax-exempt status from the federal government? ACLU is going to say yes. Well, then how come the government is underwriting discrimination when they wouldn't marry us? And the church is going to have problems. There's a story in Canada that I read just a couple of weeks ago where a lesbian couple rented a Knights of Columbus hall at a Catholic church to have their wedding. Knights of Columbus does that. They rent out their halls to people who are getting married. They want as many people to get married as possible. So they're into that business. When they found out that it was a lesbian couple, hmm, surprise, I'm sorry, we'd really like to not rent our hall out to you because we don't really believe in that kind of marriage. The lesbian couple didn't say, oh, we understand. We, we don't want to offend your religious sensibilities. They're suing the Knights of Columbus to make them extend their hall to them to do something that they don't believe. It's happening, folks. It's happening. Thought control, educational control, and religious control. This is not pie in the sky, it's not smoke screen, it's happening. Question number four. Can't some people have religious marriage and other people have civil marriage and can't we all just get along? No. Marriage is so much more than either just a civil institution or a religious institution. Marriage precedes and exceeds the church and the state. From a theological perspective, I as a Christian believe from Genesis that marriage was the first institution. God instituted marriage before he instituted the church, 
before he instituted the state, before he instituted everything. But anthropology teaches us the same thing, that marriage, pair bonding between male and female in, in, in primitive cultures rose up and existed before the state did, before religious systems rose up. And so really on that point, anthropology and Christian theology agree. Marriage precedes everything. Marriage precedes everything. Marriage is a religious institution. Marriage is a legal institution. Marriage is an emotional institution. Marriage is a psychological institution. Marriage is all of these things. It's every one of them and all of them together. And we cannot say marriage is only going to be this and it's not going to be this. To do so is to misunderstand the very nature of marriage itself. There's a quote from a very good friend of mine, Maggie Gallagher. Many of you are familiar with her and her work and her writings. She really illustrates in a very dramatic way, in a very simple way, the profound social impact that marriage has, showing us that it is not simply a religious institution. She says, there is scarcely a dollar that state and federal governments spend on social programs that is not driven in large part by family fragmentation, those problems being crime, poverty, drug abuse, teen pregnancy, school failure, and mental and physical health problems. When marriage declines in a culture, all of the important social and personal measures of well-being also decline. The state has a vested interest in making sure that marriage is strong and that marriage is the institution that brings male and female together to create and care for the next generation. Marriage cannot simply be just a religious institution, nor can it simply be just a civil institution. It has to be all of these things. So in answer to their question, can we not just have civil marriage and religious marriage? No, because such a proposition fails to understand the very nature of marriage itself. Question number five. Does marriage provide a common good? It's good that this is question number five because this is really the core of the issue. It's the center of the issue. Does marriage provide a common good? It's interesting that if you spin a globe, stab your finger down on any inhabited landmass, and go visit that culture at any time in history, you will find that they do marriage one way. They do marriage as a union between men and women. Now, you may find other differences. Differences in number of spouses. Differences in division of labor. Men and women may do different work. But it is always about men and women, bringing men and women together. There is no exception of marriage being anything but a heterosexual institution in all human cultures. Think about all the great diversity that we see in all the cultures. Think back to looking at National Geographic magazines. I mean, it's fabulous in the diversity that God has created out there in human culture. But in all those cultures, there's one commonality. It's always heterosexual marriage. Now we have to ask ourselves the question, why do we find this universality? Why do we find this universality across all cultures? Who enforces it? Is it Jerry Falwell? Did Jerry Falwell go everywhere at every time and make sure that everybody did it heterosexually? Is it the Republicans? Did the Republicans go everywhere at every time and make sure that heterosexual marriage was the norm? Or was it the Catholic Church? No. We all know that it was nature. Nature enforces it. And nature's God drives it. That is why we find that universality. And isn't it actually kind of arrogant to say that as we stand at the stream of human experience and see that stream flowing like the great Amazon or Mississippi River, that it's always heterosexual, that somehow just because we're in the modern age, that somehow we can improve upon that? Folks, that is the height of arrogance. We have to learn from history. We have to learn from experience. 
that marriage needs to be, that it ought to be a heterosexual union. Every culture needs natural marriage, marriage to be a union between men and women. No culture needs same-sex marriage. Not this culture, not any culture on the face of the earth present today, or any culture in the past. Because if they did need it, what would have happened? They would have invented it far beyond today. Remember now, let me remind you of this. It was only since 2001 that any nation on the face of the earth ever legalized any form of same-sex marriage. Yeah, it was the Netherlands, and then shortly after that, Belgium, and then certain provinces in Canada, and then Massachusetts. It's only been in the couple last nanoseconds of human history that we have even entertained this discussion. And again, it's arrogance that drives that, human arrogance that drives that. Marriage does four primary jobs in every single society, in every single culture. And the anthropologist teaches this. If you look through text after text after text, how different cultures do marriage, you'll find that marriage always does four basic things in every culture. First of all, and we're going to look at these all individually. First of all, it socializes men. Marriage socializes men by linking men to women. A woman, Gail Collins, wrote a, a fabulous book. She is the editorial page editor at the New York Times. And in her spare time, whatever spare time she has, she managed to write this wonderful book called America's Women. And she wanted to examine what was the role that women played in the founding of America and the development of America, and not just the Betsy Rosses and the big names we know, but common women, everyday women. What was the role? And here's what she said. The key role that women played in American society, and, and really in all societies, is getting men to behave. Is getting men to behave. Men who are not linked to women are men who are not likely to behave. Let's think about this just real quickly, okay? On Saturday, the, the, the woman goes off to do what she's going to do with her friends, shopping or, or, or going to a movie or whatever. And she gives the husband a list of things to do. Does the husband get right on his list of things to do and get it done? Or does he think, my wife's coming back at 4. I could probably start on my work at about 3.30. And just lays on the couch and watches TV all day. You know, it's women that get men to behave. It's women that get men to be productive. She says at the founding of the colonies, the mother country England sent men over to found the colonies and to start producing and to send checks back to England. Well, the men came over here, but the checks weren't going back to England. So they sent some folks over to check out the situation, what was happening. And here's what Gail Collins says. She says, those people who came over to check on the men said the men are engaged in the activities that they are daily engaged in, which is bowling in the streets. The men were not working. They were goofing off. You know, it's bowling in the streets was the equivalent of us pulling the couch out onto the porch and watching TV out on the porch, you know. So what did they do? What did they do to get the men working? They sent women to the colonies. They sent women to the colonies for the men to marry. And those women got the men working, got them planting crops, got them producing things, got them building homes, got them starting businesses. That is a key role of what women do. Women socialize men. And it's not just true in America, but it's true in every single human civilization. That is a need, the need to get men productive. Second, marriage regulates sexuality. Every society needs sexual guardrails that all of us should live in between. And any society that fails to enforce these sexual guardrails is a society that ceases to be. Think about the great Roman and Greek empire. Why are they not around anymore? Because they erased their sexual mores, their sexual values. Every society needs people to behave themselves sexually. And whether they've got sophisticated laws or simple cultural taboos, they have to have rules for here's how we behave. Marriage does that, and it enforces monogamy. And monogamy brings us to our third point. Marriage protects women. By enforcing monogamy, 
it protects women. A society's most serious problem is the unattached male. And we have to find a way to protect women from aggressive, selfish males. And we typically do this through marriage. And we typically do it through monogamy. When you have non-monogamous cultures, women become commodities to be used and traded. Think about what has happened in the sexual revolution. And think about the way that women have been treated since the sexual revolution. It has not been good for women. Society needs marriage to make sure that every woman has a man and every man has a woman as much as is conceivably possible and that they both care for and protect one another. When you have a culture that has high rates of marriage, high rates of men connected permanently to women and women connected to men, you have a culture where the domestic violence rate is significantly lower than in cultures where you don't have that. Marriage protects women. That's the third point. Fourth point is, and this is probably the most obvious to all of us, marriage provides mothers and fathers for children. As my good friend Maggie Gallagher says, marriage is the way that we make sure that the people who produce the baby stick around to care for and provide and raise the baby. Every society needs that to happen. Every society must encourage marriage because marriage makes men more productive, marriage protects women, and marriage gives children mothers and fathers. There are many among us who say that marriage as a social institution is really only about children. And that if there's not children involved, then we really don't care what the couples do. That's true to some degree, but we can't lose sight of marriage domesticates and socializes men, and it protects women. Okay? It serves that very important social function, but beyond that, it also provides the next generation. The next generation of taxpayers, the next generation of producers, the next generation of good citizens to keep our society going. And mothers and fathers together are most likely to raise good citizens than anybody else. So we have to understand marriage plays a significant and very, very important social role. Question number six, is it healthy to put children in experimental families? We have to understand and recognize this fact. No society at any time, primitive or developed, ancient or modern, has ever raised a generation of children in same-sex homes. Never happened. And if we are going to start engaging in it, I don't know of a better definition of experiment than that. Nobody's ever done it. We don't know how it's going to turn out. So we necessarily, if we're going to go this way, we'll have to subject children to experimental families. Same-sex marriage is a vast, untested social experiment on children. This is a very, very key line, and I would encourage you to use it again and again because it gets right at the heart of the issue. Same-sex marriage is a vast, untested social experiment on children. When I was doing research for my book, Marriage on Trial, that I co-authored with a very good friend of mine, Dr. Bill Meyer, I wanted to see what lesbian scholars and gay scholars had to say about the process of growing up in intentionally motherless or fatherless families. And I found this book, The Lesbian Parenting Book. And I looked in the index for parenting and I flipped to the section where they talked about this. And here's what they said. What they said is very, very instructive for us. These two doctors who wrote this book, two, two um, medical doctors and, and, and I guess a, a couple, two women, two lesbian women, said that our children are not the only ones who may find themselves in uncharted territory. It can be exhilarating and sometimes scary to be painting a new and different lesbian family tree. Notice the words there, uncharted territory, exhilarating and scary. What do those words bring to mind? For me, it's things like bungee jumping or very scary roller coaster rides. And you know what? Those things are fantastic for adults. But you know what? We do not subject children to them. It would be cruel to strap a child into a bungee cord and throw them over and just let them have fun. 
it would be cruel to strap a young child into a roller coaster and send them on their way. But that is exactly what these doctors are telling us the lesbian family is like. And it gets even worse. Considering how boys would do in lesbian homes, they have this to say. It will be interesting to see over time whether lesbian sons have an easier or harder time developing their gender identity than do boys with live-in fathers. We live in a warning label society. At every turn, we are faced with a warning label to tell us that no animal or person was harmed in the development of this product. Whenever we use makeup, whenever we shampoo our hair, we're told no animal was harmed in the testing of this product. And we can rest easy. But when it comes to the lesbian home, the best thing that they can tell us is it will be interesting to see. They cannot assure us that no harm will come. The best they can tell us is it will be interesting to see. Folks, I don't want to gloss over that too quickly. I want us to really soak that in. We're talking about children. We don't experiment on animals, but we are experimenting on children. We are being asked to join and endorse a society-wide vast experiment on children. And as they tell us, it will be interesting to see how it turns out. How many of you think it will be interesting to see? Or how many of you think it would be actually cruel to subject children to this? We need to understand that and to help other people understand it. Question number seven. Whenever I debate this, this, this issue and I present the research, my opponent will always say, well, Mr. Stanton, you can say whatever you want to do and you can write all the books that you want but the American Medical Association, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Psychiatric and the American Psychological Association have all said that same-sex parenting is just fine. And you know what, folks? To mention all those organizations is pretty much of a discussion stopper. You know, they expect, what in the world am I going to do? I'm just Glenn Stanton, some guy from Focus on the Family, you know, who's written a couple of books. But what we come back and say is, those organizations are wrong, and I'll tell you exactly why. First of all, let's look at the statement that the American Academy of Pediatrics made about the effect of same-sex parenting on children. And they were really one of the first organizations and really one of the most dominant leaders in this, and a lot of the other organizations kind of followed suit. But here's what they said. There is a considerable body of professional literature that suggests children with parents who are homosexual have the same advantages and same expectations for health, adjustment, and development as children whose parents are heterosexual. But first we have to understand how the AAP came to this decision, the decision that we just read, the quote that we just looked at. Was it because all the learned pediatricians joined together, mulled through the research, discussed it, debated, and then after many months, many years, came to this conclusion? No, it was a small panel of eight people that came up with this statement and really foisted it upon the larger membership of the American Academy of Pediatrics. And when their statement came out, this was an email that was sent from the lead author of the statement endorsing same-sex marriage to a select group of members in the American Academy of Pediatrics. Here's what she said in, re in, in, in response to what the AAP was hearing from its membership on their same-sex marriage decision. It says, the AAP has received more messages, almost all of them critical, from members about the issue of same-sex parenting than it has ever received on any other topic. This is a serious problem, as it means it will become harder to continue the work that we have been doing to use the AAP as a vehicle for positive change. Notice that last line. It will become harder to continue the work we have been doing to use, to use the AAP as a vehicle for positive change. Folks, does that sound like careful, deliberative science to you? 
or activism. It's activism. And there is a reason that these organizations, and the AAP being one of them, cannot come to such a conclusion. That is because we simply have not had the experiment yet. Social sciences need two things in order to come to a sure, definitive conclusion. It needs a large population of people to study, and it needs a very, very long time to study that large population over to see the impact. And as we're going to see in a minute, from the very studies that these medical organizations cite, we do not have either of those things. This is a quote from the actual article from Pediatrics, which was their statement endorsing same-sex parenting. The study itself admits, when you read the study itself, that they don't have the first thing that's necessary for social science to come to a conclusion. Let me read it. Research exploring the diversity of parental relationships among gay and lesbian parents is just beginning. The small and non-representative samples studied and the relatively young age of the children suggest some reserve. Notice that phrase, suggests some reserve. When you, we read that earlier statement just a minute ago, did you hear any reserve in their voice? No. But when you actually read the study itself, here's the warning that they give. We don't have large enough samples to study. Another study that they cite, which came out of the American Sociological Review, which is commonly referred to as the Stacey Biblar study, had this to say, thus far no work, no work has compared children's long-term achievement in education, occupation, income, and other domains of life. How can we conclude anything when the research is just beginning? Folks, we don't have to be scientists to know that something is seriously amiss here. You can't draw a conclusion when the experiment itself hasn't even started and when the documents themselves that they've considered tell us that the samples are too small and no long-term work has been done. It leaves us in the place of not really knowing how same-sex homes will impact children because we have not raised a generation of children in those homes. We would have to subject thousands of children, millions of children to such homes in order to find out what would happen. And I don't know of anybody who believes that's an ethical thing to do. But we do know what kind of families kids need. Question number eight. How do we know what kind of families children need? Well, we know from experience. We've had a lot of family experimentation in this nation over the past 30 to 40 years. We have probably had more family experimentation in this nation than any other nation on the face of the earth ever has. We have had experiments with easy divorce, no-fault divorce, single parenting by choice, cohabitation, the sexual revolution, and fatherlessness. And we have had millions of children raised in those kinds of homes over long periods of time. And let me ask you, what do you think the research says? Do you think the research says that this experimentation has elevated all of the important measures of human and child well-being? No. No significant measure of human well-being has been elevated by any of the experimentation that we have engaged in in the past 30 to 40 years. It's a very dramatic statement. No human well-being measure has been elevated by any of the experimentation that we have seen over the past 30 to 40 years. We know what happens. Let's look at some of the research. And let's not look at conservative research or partisan advocacy research. Let's look at middle of the road, common research. Two organizations, the first organization that we're gonna look at is Child Trends. Child Trends is, is, is really more of a moderate or even perhaps liberal organization that advocates for child well-being. And as you can see on this, this information here, they did a study a number of years ago in 2002, and they asked, 
how does marriage impact children and what type of family configuration is best at elevating and increasing healthy child development? Here's what they said. Thus, it is not simply the presence of two parents, as some have assumed, but the presence of two biological parents that seems to support child development. Now, let me ask you a question. How many children living in same-sex homes are living with both biological parents? If you think all the way back to that discussion that our parents had with us so long ago, we know that no children that are growing up with two same-sex parents are living with two biological parents. And this tells us about the nature of those families. The second organization, the Center for Law and Social Policy, again, a very moderate or even liberal organization, did the same sort of study. They wanted to see what kind of family structure most profitably contributes to child well-being. And here's what they said. Most researchers now agree that together these studies, the studies that they examined in their research, support the notion that on average children do best when they are raised by their two married biological parents. The research is very, very clear. Same-sex families are less than best because they deny children their mother and their father. The research is very, very clear. So what do we say to all these distinguished, learned medical organizations when they tell us that same-sex parenting is just fine? You need to go back to school and you need to study the literature. And again, it's not the members of these organizations. It's some of the elitist leaders at the top that are driving these organizations in these directions. They need to go back and look at the literature. The literature is very, very clear that children do best when they are raised by two moms and dads and pediatricians who practice in their offices every day know this to be true. That's why they responded so strongly and so adamantly to the AAP's statement. Question number nine. Is same-sex family about the needs of children or is it about the wants of adults? In order to answer that question, we can learn a lot from the world's most famous lesbian mom. Who in the world is that? That's Rosie O'Donnell. Rosie O'Donnell, a number of years ago, did an interview with Diane Sawyer. And in that interview, she talked about her family, and she talked about being a lesbian and a lesbian mom and the experience of that, and her children. And the subject of her little boy, Parker, came up. Parker was six years old at the time. And Diane Sawyer asked Rosie, she says, does Parker ever ask about his dad? And Rosie said yes. In fact, I want to read it from the transcript just so that you get the impact of this. What does little Parker say? Rosie says this. He says, I want to have a daddy. And Rosie says, I can imagine that would be great. And it would probably be easier for them if I were married to a man. But here's what I tell them. Parker, if you were to have a daddy you wouldn't have me as a mommy because I'm the kind of mommy who wants another mommy. That is a stunning statement. And I don't even know if Rosie appreciates what she said. Little Parker wants a daddy. And little Parker didn't learn about needing a daddy because Rosie unwittingly enrolled him in a fundamentalist day school where they indoctrinated him with that. Or he didn't get the idea from listening to Dr. Dobson on the radio every day. He knows he needs a daddy because he's a little boy and there's no adult in his home that's like he is who can teach him what it's like to grow up to be a man. And so he has that desire. I want a daddy. And what's the answer from his mom? The answer is, Parker, I'm sorry, you don't get what you need because I want what I want. And there are a whole lot of different systems of parenting out there, but I don't know of anyone who thinks that is a good idea of parenting. It's remarkable. Okay, now, whenever we debate this issue, the other side says, okay, that's all good and fine, Glenn, 
but would you really deny all the thousands of children out there that are being raised by same-sex parents the rights and benefits and protections of marriage? And the answer is, let's ask Parker and all the little children like him. Has he ever said, Mama, why can't we have all the rights and benefits and protections of marriage? That's an adult argument. Adults care about such things. Children want their parents. Little girls want their daddy. Little boys want their daddy. Little boys and girls want their mommies. But same-sex marriages, same-sex families cannot provide that. Why? Because the needs of the adults come first. When considering same-sex marriage and the needs of children over and against the wants and desires of adults, it's instructive to compare this experiment, the same-sex family experiment, with the no-fault divorce experiment. And one of the women that is probably the most learned individual on the impact of divorce on children, really in the world, is Dr. Judith Wallerstein. And she just published a book in 2000 where she looked at the long-term impact of divorce on children. And what she says in there, looking back, is, is, is very haunting, and it really reminds us of kind of what we're experiencing here today. Let me share this quote with you. She says, of the divorce experiment in the early 70s, we embarked on a gigantic social experiment without any idea of how the next generation would be affected. And the quote continues, if the truth be told and if we are able to face it, the history of divorce in our society is replete with unwarranted assumptions that adults have made about children simply because such assumptions are congenial to adult wishes. And here's something that's very, very telling. At the end of the day, and we hear the ethic from Rosie O'Donnell and other lesbian parents, how different is Rosie than the 1970s or 80 pariah man who goes out and gets a trophy wife who says everybody else is going to have to adjust because of what I want? You know, Donald Trump is not a whole lot different than Rosie O'Donnell because they both want what they want and everybody else has to make adjustments. And that is not a good, compassionate family ethic. No society anywhere has been able to sustain itself with a buffet-like mentality to family, where adults just go through the line, pick and choose what they want according to their own tastes and desires, and one choice is just as good as the other, and then everybody has to deal with the implications and the fallout from it. Question number 10, last question. Does gender really matter? That is what this issue all comes down to. Does gender matter? And we have to understand that the same-sex family proponents really do incorporate what I call a Mr. Potato Head theory of humanity. Basically, same core and just different external interchangeable parts that there is no real difference between male and female except for exterior. If a family wants to have two women, that's great. If a family wants to have two men, that's great. If a family wants to have a man and a woman, that's great. And there's really no difference between the three of them. One is just as good as another, like chocolate or vanilla ice cream, six of one, half dozen another. But folks, we have to understand that male and female, mother and father, husband and wife, are not just simply mere preferences. They are essential for the family. And to say otherwise is really a very anti-human view of humanity. Going back to one of those earlier questions, how does your same-sex family hurt my family? Your same-sex family hurts my family by saying ultimately at the end of the day that gender does not matter, that we do not need male and female. Every male same-sex family says that all women are not needed for the family. And as a husband, I will never allow anybody to say that about my wife or my little girls. And the lesbian family says that all the men here are not needed for the family. And as a father, that offends me as a man, that offends me, and I will never allow 
that message to be taught to my little boy because he does matter, because my little girls do matter, because my wife matters, because all of us matter. As gendered beings, we matter for the family. Heterosexual marriage celebrates diversity by bringing the two parts of humanity together, male and female, into a cooperative bond. Same-sex family really does celebrate sameness. And it really does say that ultimately male and female do not matter. And that's why this proposition is so dangerous. But they'll tell us all kids really need are loving parents. Folks, we need to understand that the two most loving moms in the world can never be a daddy to a little boy or a little girl. All the love in the world cannot turn a woman into a dad. It is not the same for a little boy to wake up early in the morning and go out on a fishing trip with his mother and her lesbian life partner. Okay? It's just not the same. Likewise, the two most loving dads in the world can never, never be a mama to a little boy or a little girl. Children need a whole lot more than love from any two parents. As we saw earlier in the research, they need mothers and fathers. This is absolutely essential. There are a number of recommended resources that we would offer you for, for research and study and education beyond this presentation. The first one is a book that I wrote with a good friend of mine, Dr. Bill Meyer, that I referred to earlier. It's called Marriage on Trial. And that book, along with Dr. Dobson's book, Marriage Under Fire, are, are really two great resources to help you understand all the research and all the lines of argumentation for engaging this issue. And then the third book is a book that I wrote a number of years ago called Why Marriage Matters. And it really provides the sociological case for why marriage is an important social good. And together, all of those resources will help equip you to be good, solid, intelligent, and persuasive defenders of marriage. And then lastly, at our website, Focus on Social Issues, we have a whole host of research products there and short, brief articles that can help you engage this issue. And much of the information that you have seen presented here is at that website, and you can find it quite easily. So thank you very much, and I pray for you as you go out and become very articulate and able and persuasive defenders of the family. God bless you.